the Minnesota Wild will make it to the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. At least that's what I think. Kirsten and I break down the Dallas Stars' keys players and how the Wild can defeat them. As always, we're created by New Voice Studios, presented by Soda Stick, brought to you by Talk North, Grain Belt, Jim Beam, Livia Weight Loss, and Royal Credit Union. This is Season 4, Episode 172. Celebrate your favorite Minnesota sports teams and moments with SodaStick.com. Relive the Met Center chairs, the Metrodome push, and so much more with unique and quality garb found only at SodaStick. Don't forget to add code BARDOWNBEAUTIES at checkout for 15% off all of your purchases. At Jim Beam, they know the importance of tradition. Like chanting, let's play hockey prior to the start of each game, or playing the state of hockey anthem after a wild win. This season, raise one to your fan family with the bourbon that invites us all to come as friends and leave as family. Jim Beam Bourbon Whiskey, the official bourbon whiskey partner of the Minnesota Wild and XL Energy Center. Drink smart. Jim Beam Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. 40% alcohol by volume. Copyright 2021. James B. Beam Distilling Company, Incorporated, Fairmont, Kentucky. Hello, everybody. What's up? Bar Down Beauties. Playoff time. Game one. Today, well, while you're listening to it, today, Monday, we're recording this Sunday. We're giving you better up-to-date content. We apologize last week. We went a little off the rails, but not today, Kirsten, not today. It's playoff time. Minnesota's in Dallas, ready to take on the Stars in game one and then game two coming up Wednesday in Dallas. They're back home Friday, Sunday. How are you feeling? How are we feeling about the Stars matchup? I think it was the more ideal, potentially, but how do we, uh, how do we think that we're going to do I'm going to be honest. I thought this season the Wild have played better when they've played Colorado as opposed to Dallas. I think Mm -hmm. the Wild have struggled when they played Dallas this season. So I'm probably the outlier here. I would have rather seen them play Colorado over Dallas. I know. Like I said, I think I'm the outlier here. Um, I'm feeling okay heading into this playoff series, but I'm not feeling great. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be real. That's fair. What makes you nervous for me I agree and I, I think you brought this up at our live record shout out to Harbor Bar in Stillwater for hosting us and Green Belt for letting us get out there we might have another one we might not depends on how far the Minnesota Wild decide to take us on this playoff journey Um, but you're right like I had said earlier on in the year that Dallas scares me a little bit and so does Colorado frankly and again yes you have to play everybody to get through to the final to the Stanley Cup the thing that scares me more about Dallas now I had kind of cooled on it But without a Jewel Eric's neck, you are going up against some of the top centers in the league. Jamie Benn, Tyler Sagan. They've got Jason Robertson absolutely crushing it. And then Miro Heiskanen back on defense. That's what scares me. Jewel Eric's neck now, as of this past weekend's practice, is getting better. He's skated on his own for the first time on Saturday. Um, I still don't anticipate you seeing him until the second round, unless they're in kind of a backs against the wall game seven situation. Then maybe Ecker gets in there to try to be the difference maker. But that's what worries me. Yes, the Eck injury has been detrimental anyway, but especially against this Dallas team that's so deep up the middle. That's my biggest fear. What about you, Kirsten? Well, I mean, obviously it's Jill Erickson. I mean, that goes without even asking me. You knew the answer to that one. I did. Um, But I am happy to hear you report, Jesse, your quality reporting. So shout out to you you. that Jill Erickson is skating because something I read last week, he was working out, but allegedly was not even close to skating. So seeing that was just another gut punch. So you have brought some light to my morning here. So thank you. You're welcome. Follow me on Jesse uh, on Twitter, Jesse underscore Pierce for more of those fantastic updates as I cover this team throughout the playoff. No, I mean, a, again, he's a cyborg, right? Erickson Eck is like a cyborg. He is just this robotic beast of a man. So there's no surprise. And obviously come playoffs, he's played through injuries before. So, I mean, he's probably itching to get in there. Um, but again, the Minnesota wild itching to get there. Let's talk about goaltending for Dallas. Let's focus. We're going to focus this first segment here on the goaltending situation. Um, but we're going to focus it on the, the Dallas side. I thought you guys, I was, you thought it was going to go into the other one, but no, we'll wait for that for the second segment. Jake Ottinger has been an absolute workhorse for the Dallas stars. He has put them in the position that they are in without question. Now, Jake Ottinger, obviously a hashtag one of us fellow Minnesotan. Um, not love at see- the moment, not heading into this playoff series. He's not oh, one of us. We're just, he's dead to us. Well, we just can't be friends during okay. this moment in time. Like right now, like, Reasonably, we're not friends. I think most people would understand that. Once this playoff series is done, 
then we can be friends. Okay. So it's like, we're taking a little break. We're on a break. We're like on a, a break. Little, a, we're on a break with Jake. Ottinger. And I think okay. both parties would agree we're on a break. So there's none of that. One person thinks we're on a break and the other doesn't. I mean, you know, his family's going to be in there. So there's going to be plenty of star contingency rooting mm. on too much, too, too many. Much. Yeah. That being said, and, and again, on the good side, when we're not playing them, I love Jake Ottinger, right? He is, he's made some incredible freaking saves this year. But Scott Wedgwood is the backup. I imagine he'll play probably less. I do see Dallas probably riding Otter a little bit more. And lucky for them, he's young. Because in any other situation, again, he has had the lion's share, if not more than the lion's share of starts this year as Scott Wedgwood worked his way back from an injury. But Scott Wedgwood is good too. Do you see, how do you see that tandem playing out. Minnesota obviously has struggled to score. They went on their little hot stretch while Kaprizov was out, found that secondary scoring, but it's kind of reverted back as the regular season ended a little bit to the more defense first style mentality, which is playoff hockey. But how do you Mm -hmm. think uh, they're going to do? How do you think Dallas is going to manage their goaltending situation? Or do you think they'll do like Craig Berube did last year in St. Louis and make a switch if they're uh, losing in the series? I feel it'll probably be more if Dallas finds themselves down, then they might switch it up. But I think for the most part, Ottinger, like he, I don't think there's any question about it. He is the starter. He is going to just kind of take the reins. I think they're going to use him as much as they can and they should. And you brought up a good point, Jesse. I just think like, imagine like if Minnesota were just riding flurry at this point in his age, this point in his career, all throughout the postseason, that would be not detrimental, but it just, it would be not good. Like not good. It, so the youth that Ottinger has use it to their advantage right now. It is a big asset for him. And so far up to this point for Dallas, it's been working out pretty well. But I mean, I especially come the postseason. I don't know. It's it's kind of one of those risky things that you do because you don't know kind of what the cause and effect of it could be. But I think as of right now, where things stand, it's Ottinger. Yeah, I would agree. And I mean, that's a smart play. I had mentioned Miro Heiskanen on defense, a 23 year old blue liner who ironically, after John Klingberg left Dallas, started taking up those minutes left by Klingberg. Klingberg played very well for Dallas back in the day. Um, but he's the other thing that scares me. He is their top defense and he's obviously going to try to get matched up with the Kirill Caprice offline, maybe even the Matt Boldy line. Who knows? I'm sure it depends on who's which lines rolling, but I imagine that Caprice offline. He's really freaking good. He is a good, he's what you wanted from John Klingberg. I mean, frankly, he is the old John Klingberg because he can play well defensively, but he's also able to jump in on the offensive play, start the momentum. Uh, You know, the defense, that's pretty much the only one, but then they also have their standard veteran defenseman back there too. The names that you know and are usually fearful. How much do you think Miro Heiskanen is going to play a factor in the Dallas stars success against Minnesota, or can you make him a non-factor? Can, is it possible that uh, they're able to do that? And again, he's not the only one I've got three players, Miro Heis or four players. I'll say Heiskanen is number two. Jake Ottinger is number three. And then I've got two others after that, but, but how do you feel about this Kirsten? I mean, (laughs) I think I would love to see the wild shut him down. I don't exactly know how we're going to do that. Yeah. But I do see it him being a problem. I see him matched up against that Kaprizov line. And I also say that is why we need to see other guys on the team step up so much. Because you know everyone in the National Hockey League knows Kirill Kaprizov is that guy for Minnesota. So that's why I think it's been especially disappointing just as a fan when Kirill has come back. He seamlessly came back in, but everyone else completely dropped off. And mm-hmm. you cannot do that. You also need to step it up. So we need to continue to see Matt Boldy doing what he was doing, their line. And I mean, if I just think also, and this probably goes without saying, you have somebody double teaming Kirill or them just really shutting them down. Once you have like that Matt Boldy, that mm-hmm. line, they'll make up for it. And so that's what I'm nervous about. Another random thought that I have, I just hope John Klingberg knows who he's playing for in this playoff series. And he's not playing for Dallas or playing like he's rooting for Dallas. So let's just, let's show up for Minnesota. Yeah. I don't think that'll be the case. I just think, you know, defensively he sucks. So like he might accidentally look like he's playing for Dallas once in a while. Right. But I probably worded it poorly, but that's what I was going for. I figured he was going to be playing so questionably that it's like, (laughs) who are you really on the ice for right now? Us or Dallas? Yeah. 
We helped you out. Teamwork. Teamwork makes yes, the dream work, baby. You. You're welcome. The other person for Dallas that I am concerned about, Wyatt Johnston, a 19-year-old rookie, absolutely tearing it up for the stars, setting franchise records, um, doing things at the age of 19 that's so rare and far few between. I mean, Tyler Sagan, another Dallas Stars, was doing similar things, but not quite even to this pace. Again, Dallas is pretty loaded. They've got a good balance of veterans and youth, and that's what is also, it's a good blend, a good mix but it's a terrifying one too because you have those vets in there that know what a series takes. Some of them have won the cup with the stars. Um, And then you've got these young guns who have stepped up to the the case. But Wyatt Johnston, again, at 19 years old, has been just tearing up the league. Um, You know, he... He's struggled sometimes against some of the best players, right, in the NHL, which happens at 19. But how much is Wyatt Johnson going to factor in? And then we'll get to our final Dallas star player to watch. But what do you think of Wyatt Johnson, Kirsten? Um, I don't know. It kind of, again, I'm going back to when I was listening to Tyler Sagan talk on TNT the other night. It's kind of reminiscent of a young Tyler Sagan who won the cup in his rookie season. And Sagan, what he was saying was basically the team Dallas has right now is better, a better team than the team he won the Stanley Cup with. And so just that take on it kind of scares me a -hmm. little bit. And with Wyatt Johnston, like you were saying, I just think he's going to be another kid to look out for. And hopefully defensively, Minnesota can rise to the occasion and do what they're supposed to do. I mean, again, he's that threat up the middle. 41 points in 82 games playing between Jamie Benn and Evgeny Dadnov on that second line for Dallas. So that just... It's a deeper threat. I mean, he's done absolutely tremendous. 6'1", 185 pounds, moves the puck well, drafted third overall, 23rd, excuse me, 23rd overall in 2021. Um, Yeah, I I hate it. I hate watching. I love seeing a young kid succeed like that, but it's also like, God damn it. Like, it's it's hard to stop, right? I mean, again, when you- I don't like it when they're a rival. No. Well, and, and when you're putting up him against maybe an older pairing of defensemen, that speed could kill you. Now you've got the size. You're putting a boy up against a man still arguably right at 19. When you're going against a 30 some year old Jared Spurgeon, a little bit of a difference maker, but like it's, it's going to be interesting. Now, obviously the final piece for Dallas that you're going to have to look out for no surprise, Jason Robertson runner up to Kirill Kaprizov's Calder, but has been absolutely destroying it since he came onto the scene. Um, He was last week's NHL star of the week. He's just been doing unreal things. Again, another guy breaking franchise records. And I'm talking not just breaking Dallas Stars records. He's breaking our Minnesota North Stars records too. Fun player to watch when he's not playing against you. And again, he is the one that they are going to absolutely have to contain without question. Your number one shutdown player for Dallas. Kirsten, additional thoughts on Jason Robertson. I just, we knew this was going to happen. We knew, and it was a, it's a very exciting time in hockey, specifically like Western Conference, Central Division. You had two young superstars in Kirill Kaprizov, Jason Robertson. We remember all the talks during the Calder Trophy race, whatnot. We knew this was not going to be the end of the discussion. Like we knew it's Jason Robertson, Kirill Kaprizov, two Mm -hmm. of the biggest faces, the faces of the organizations right now. So, I mean, just a phenomenal player, but yeah, you don't want him matched up against your team. The Dallas Stars finished with 108 points on the year. Jason Robertson finished with 109, 46 goals, 63 assists in all 82 games, uh, bringing his career total to 234 points. He had a hundred and he has got 104 goals, excuse me, in his career, 130 assists. So not too shabby for the 23 year old from Arcadia, California. Yeah, he scares me like a lot like that's and the thing is, he just seems like a likable guy. Again, we're on a break. I get it. I'm not allowed to like them, but he's fun to watch. I mean, it's good for USA, California hockey stuff, right? You know, we got that going for us. Yeah, especially seeing kids from California come and make it out. I mean, it's just goes to the growth of the game. Growth of the game. Yes, we love it. They're going to grow the game down in Texas with this playoff series, kicking off a little rivalry, a little reminiscent. The team's actually squared off. Back in 2016, I believe it was, uh, in the first round, Dallas getting the best of them, uh, four to two, taking it to game six. Minnesota almost coming back in that game six, if I recall correctly. I do recall correctly because I just wrote about it for the playoff program. So, like, look it up. Go read that story. Uh, Yeah, so 
We're going to take a quick break, Kirsten, and when we come back, let's talk about the Minnesota Wild and the pieces that they have in place to take this series down. We'll be right back. Hey, guys, Jesse here. Raise your hand if you're ready for summer. All right, now raise your hand if you're ready to look ready for summer. I know I'm ready to get bikini bod fit. That's why I teamed up with Livia uh, to lose that weight before the summer season start. You could lose up to 20 pounds before the summer season. How fantastic does that sound? Livia's doctor recommended program will help you do just that to look and feel your best throughout your weight loss journey. It has been voted number one in Minnesota where you receive personalized and guided support from Livia's team of experts. My go-to is over at the Woodbury Clinic. They have been so helpful in getting me on track and feeling great. If you join today, you receive three months free so really, what are we waiting for, guys? Get summer ready with Livia and call today, 855-GO-LIVIA or visit Livia.com. That's L-I-V-E-A dot com. Livia has been awesome for me, and I can't wait to hear how it works for you. Be sure to mention Jesse Pierce and or the Bar Down Beauties when you go in for your first meeting. And uh, let's get bikini ready. Let's go. Have a good one. We're back. Grit first. Kirsten, that is the slogan for your Minnesota Wild heading into the playoffs. It's funny, last weekend, or maybe it was, I think, just last Tuesday when they had hosted their final regular season game at home, and I took a picture of the outside of the X. People hated the slogan. I don't think it's that bad. What are your thoughts on grit first as the thing? I like it, looks what good with like the design. Go look it up. Like the design has kind of that like street feel a little bit, right? Like street hockey, but. I don't, I mean, I don't hate it, but people hate it. What do you think? Grit first. I'm just letting my facial expression kind of speak for it. I will say the wild have been a gritty team all season long. So bringing grit into it, it's very fitting. I don't like it. I also don't like it. I'm not a fan. We could have, you know, shout out. Um, It does look good. The design looks good on the front of the building, but just it's not my favorite I can't I don't hate I I think it's funny because I sometimes there's grit I don't think of the Minnesota Wild as necessarily an incredibly gritty team though you know like I picture guys like the blues and and maybe they are like I'm not saying that obviously but sometimes Minnesota felt like they had too much like they had all this talent and so it took them a while to come around to this grit first mentality in the first place so I think that's where it's a little off-putting like Okay, you have Kirill Caprice. He's not, well, he's kind of a gritty player, I guess. I mean, I don't, I think of like the Ryan Hartmans, Marcus Hartmans, Ryan Reeves, the fourth line, like Mason Shaw. There's a lot of really gritty players who will do the dirty work on the team. Do him, doer. Exactly. So, I mean, I see where it comes into play. I think the Wild are grittier than people give them credit for. Um, Mm -hmm. But I, I, I understand it, but I'm not huge on it. Let's start and dive into what the Minnesota Wild are going to bring, at least for game one. Dean Evson not telling us the goaltender. Let's start with the goaltender. You know, I got to bring goaltending into this. Dean had told me before when I point blank asked him a couple weeks ago, or does a tandem work in the playoffs? Usually you see a team just riding their hot goaltender. And that makes sense. Like I said, we said Dallas is expected to ride Jake Ottinger until they have to make a change. And they should, because that is the situation they are in. Minnesota all year long has done their rotation. Dean won't call it a rotation, but it's been a rotation. It's every other game. Very rarely are you seeing a goaltender do back-to-back starts. And I'm not talking back-to-back games necessarily, but in general, starting two games in a row because they've gotten so much good from Marc-Andre Fleury and Philip Gustafson. Even better, Dean said he believes that a goalie rotation of sorts can work. He plans to use both of them. Now, how that looks, I'm sure it's TBD. I would love to do every other game you will throw off a team by putting a new goaltender in there for each game especially when those goaltenders are Philip Gustafson and Marc-Andre Fleury right like two completely different styles of play your defense plays a little bit differently in front of each of them as well for better or for worse um but I and I'm gonna just say it it's Gus you're going Gus game one I had said Marc-Andre Fleury earlier but the way that Dean played out these last few games of the regular season has me thinking it's Gus Again, as of Sunday, 925, we don't know that answer because Dean's keeping keeping it close, probably because he got in trouble last year when he announced Marc-Andre Fleury starting. Uh, I'm going Gus, and I'm rolling both goalies throughout the series. Kirsten, how are you approaching the goaltending situation? 
Well, first, looking at the line projections that have been tweeted out from practices, I love how, you know, follow Jesse Pierce on Twitter. Yeah, Jesse it's it's Pierce. your forward lines, defensive pairings, and then just goaltending is <laughs> so um, I love just kind of the drama surrounding it. I think they're going to play both goalies. I think it's going to be a rotation like you mentioned, and I love that because it will throw off the opposing team. It's one of those things where it's an inconsistency for them. And so I'm excited about that. But also on the flip side, I think Gus should be your starter, but I think it's going to be flurry. Okay. Should we put a bet on this? Why does everything have to be a bet? Because <laughs> I'm a competitor. I I don't <laughs> want to bet. No, I don't want to bet. Like but if I we think were it's going to be what flurry. Would we bet? Okay. I don't know. It's not a bet. So why does it matter? It's a bet. Um, I think us, you think flurry. That's it's a it, there. It's every possible thing for a bet, like a dollar. I bet a dollar doesn't have to be anything bet. bad. You could just be like, I was right. And I'll be like, that's fine. It does feel good to say, though. I'm not going to lie. Like, I do enjoy that. Uh, I hear. Well, we'll see. We will see. We will find out probably tomorrow, maybe today when I'm at practice. Who knows? We'll see. Um, Let's go to the defense. Looks like. We are hard on this kid, so I like to think that Dean has been listening to the Bardown Beauties each and every week while we kind of run over John Merrill again and again because it seems that Brock Faber, again, hashtag one of us that everybody has been clamoring for, um, looks like he might have worked himself into the starting lineup come playoff time while John Merrill sits on the sidelines because Yikes, he has his performance has just gone downhill. And I think that Nashville game, the final regular season game for your Minnesota Wild, that showed you even more of the warts that John Merrill has when he didn't have somebody to help cover for him. The Merrill Klingberg, that law firm needs to go extinct. That it's just it was bad. It was very bad. Um, so it looks like Jock uh Brock Faber in Kirsten. Would you like a moment to celebrate? I do. Like I <laughs> This is going to sound so mean. Certified good guy, John Merrill. Good guy. Very yes. nice guy. His play, however, very bad. I am not. I have been very, very mean to him, but it's just because like, I don't get it. I don't understand why you had been playing so much when your game just was so bad. And I will say this on the flip side, Brock Faber, he had what, like one full game I don't remember if he played during Nashville did he play during Nashville or was he uh no he yes yes no yes so he's played potentially two two games for the Minnesota Wild yep he's played two games those two games he has shown more and how much he deserves this opportunity over John Merrill in my opinion Brock Faber he came from that national championship loss to Quinnipiac came in seamless like good fit as a pretty much still college player and so he just I'm I was excited to see that I was wondering too if Brock Faber was going to crack the lineup for the postseason so I'm happy to see that over John Merrill me too I just it's I mean Gotta imagine John Merrill not feeling too great about himself to have a young kid like that come in and take your spot out of nowhere, but it's warranted. I mean, when he was a healthy scratch a couple games back, it was warranted. And I think again, I and I've I've asked for this and we haven't seen it yet, and it doesn't look like we probably will. And I understand because you don't want to break it. I want Brodine and Klingberg together. I think that would be a very good pairing. I get that there's the chemistry and the long-standing pair of Broads and Dumba and I think it's cuz Brodeen can cover up anybody's mistakes. Dumba is still a, has an edge over over uh Klingberg in my opinion, but put Brodeen with Klingberg and he could cover up the bad defense which we know is there and I just I see that working really really well. Again, I know it won't happen, but I just would like I'd like to see that. I think there's potential there and yeah, I don't know. I still, I wish we had an opportunity to see it once during the regular season. Get but, understand why, but. But then who is going to cover for Dumba's mistakes? Well, right. That's that. the problem. Again, it's, that's the problem. Maybe it's Faber and Dumba. Maybe. But then you're also throwing Faber to the wolves. Yes, you are. Like, all right, kid, let's see what you got. But then again, sometimes um, initiation by fire is the best way to do it, right? You know. Yeah, that's know. true. That's true. Got to be tough. Uh, moving up on from the defense, I'm really happy because I think 
I'd mentioned last week, that's been my concern has been the defensive play as of late. Luckily, you've got two solid goaltenders behind you, so it's not you don't see it as glaring. But I think especially in that Nashville game when it was Merrill and Galagoski and Clay, like, yikes, like it's just it, it wasn't a great situation. So it does help that they've made that decision to sit Merrill. Uh, maybe he gets back in. We'll see. I mean, I would imagine that's always a possibility for him to come back for game two, game three, whatever, see how Faber plays. Um, but just an exciting opportunity for the hometown kid too. love good things happening to good people. And he is a good person. His family is fantastic. So excited to see what he can do. Excited for him. Hopefully he can get a game in here at home too, just to uh, experience that. I know he mentioned to us yesterday that, uh, He's been to plenty of playoff games, so he certainly knows the environment that can be so fun. Uh, Moving up to the offense, Marcus Johansson is okay. I'm going to shout that from the rooftops. He is good. He is good to go. Playing in game one could have been absolutely detrimental uh, after Neil Pionk cross-checked him. Hashtag one of us, another one of our Minnesotans, doing him dirty. Luckily, Johansson just very sore, going to play through it, going to be fine. Um. How, I mean, I hate to like be like, oh, but what if it would have sucked if he wasn't in not just sucked. It would have been very bad for your Minnesota wild because you're taking away an integral piece of secondary scoring, an integral piece to Matt Boldy's success and really just hampering that line. Luckily, we don't have to worry about it, Kirsten, but God, that would have been bad. Matt Boldy's already lost so much this season. I mean, he's lost his center. So that was one thing. Um, Losing Johansson, that also would have been awful, I guess. For me, I was nervous in the game against Winnipeg when I saw Johansson walk over to the bench and just looking in pain. Mm-hmm. Um, I was nervous then, I guess. For whatever reason, I just kind of was like, okay, like he's going to be fine. So I guess I wasn't as worried as everyone else was about mm-hmm. him not playing. Yeah. Um, but no, still happy that he is in the lineup. It would have been really bad. It would have. I don't know what they would have done. I don't know what Matt Boldy would have done. I don't know what that line would have looked like, but I'm happy we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about it. People are fine. People are healthy. Oscar Sunquist um, has is still remains day to day. I had the opportunity to chat with him, like just hanging out in the hallway the other day. He is such a nice guy. Like he's just a very, very sweet kid. Like I just was really, I was happy I got to like chit chat with him a little bit. Obviously, he's trying to work back from an injury that happened. He got, and I don't know if this is public, and I don't know. I'm just gonna say it. He told me that Jared Spurgeon shot hit him in the knee. So that's what is keeping him out. Uh, so hot take Jesse's breaking news over here. I Isn't that the it. second time this season Spurgeon's accidentally injured? A yeah. Teammate? I feel like Felino didn't he hurt Felino with the same I type thought, of thing? I thought like early in the season, there was yeah. another Spurgeon casualty. Just the captain taking things seriously. Like, all right, we're gonna, gonna do this. Gonna do that. Uh, but no, I mean, your lines right now for your Minnesota wild, they look okay, right? You've got Kaprizov, Hartman, Zuccarello. You've got your Johansson, Goudreau, Boldy. You've got Nyquist, Steele, Felino, Duham, Dewar, Reeves. Um, I like it. I don't hate it. I love what Gustav Nyquist has shown me in those games that he got in at the end of the regular season. I am curious to see how that line especially performs just because it's kind of such a hodgepodge, right? It's a smaller guy who's very speedy. Sam Steele's probably literally right in the middle. And then you've got Felino up on the right who's got the body and the presence. Um, that line's the most intriguing to me. We know what the other ones can do, but the third line, I have questions. And I don't know if it's good or I don't know if it's bad, but I've got questions. I've got thoughts. So okay. <laughs> we'll, perfect. We'll go there. Let's go. First, Marcus Felino has become increasingly more unhinged the later <laughs> in the season it's gotten. So remember when we kind of were like, well, Ryan Reeves, like he's shown a little more toughness that we normally see from Felino as far as like that presence, mm-hmm. some of the physicality. I think that is completely flip flopped now. Good guy, Ryan Reeves, Marcus Felino, like yeah. in people's heads, like storming around on the ice. I love it. I love that energy heading into the postseason. So shout out, Marcus. Let's see more of it. We've missed this from you. Sam Steele, kind of like a redemption for him after going through that really rough stretch where he spent like, what was it, three, four months in the press box, just scratch, Might filling in an exaggeration. I think watch. that's I think that's an exaggeration, but it was a long time. Like it was at least two months. It was consistent. And it he would fill in. He was the fill in. He'd come in here and there. 
and yeah. when there was injuries, whatnot, but he's seized the moment when he's been playing. Like, I think he's been doing a much better job. He's just, I think he's accepted his new role, but when he has been on the ice, I've enjoyed seeing his production as far as Nyquist also enjoyed that when Bill Guerin saw the opportunity to pick him up at the deadline, he knew what he was doing. He knew he was going to be ready for the postseason, And so just, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I think right now it's rolling. You're going to hate me, but I'm going to say it. Sam Steele is doing what you wanted Tyson Jones to do. Like Tyson Jones did not respond to the sitting and coming in and going in and out of the lineup, right? Whereas Sam Steele has kind of maintained, which is, it's a great characteristic and a great trait to have for a guy that's still trying to make his way in the league. But, but yeah, I mean, looking back on it, that's what I see. That was the difference. Tyson Jones didn't have that capability to respond to the scratches and come in and say like, no, I still deserve a spot in the lineup. That's kind of how I feel. Cause Tyson Jones was given some big opportunities at the beginning of the year. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to like stab twist pull there, but it just, you really did. I you really did. Um, <laughs> thanks Jesse. So I take back everything nice I said about you this morning. <laughs> um, it's nine 30 AM. I got to work in a couple hours and now I'm going to be thinking of that all day. So thank you. It could have um, been. I will say at the situation early in the season, the wild were a dumpster fire at the time. So I True. think at this point in the year, as the wild are more established and there aren't those very, and you have the line, the, not only are the wild more established, they've got pretty consistent lines. They've found chemistry within those players. So yeah. I think it's easier to transition in and out of that lineup right now, as it was those first couple months of the season when everyone was struggling hard. True. You know, so we saw at the end of the regular season, Kirill Kaprizov come back super thrilling, love to see it doing his thing, gets 40 goals on the year, becomes the first franchise player to have back to back 40 plus goal season. So those are all good things. But you and I were chit chatting about this. It seemed like the rest of the team kind of disappeared again when Kaprizov came back. And that was my fear a couple weeks ago in an episode. Go back, rewind the tapes, because I was like, I'm worried that they're going to be like, oh, we got our star back again. And I'm still kind of feeling that way just a little bit. And I know Kaprizov is a guy that will take it all and be like, yep, I got this. I want to win this badly. Not to say the other guys don't, but sometimes I think when they're down, they sit back more knowing that Kaprizov has the capability to do so much more for the team. Is it, I mean, is that crazy? Like, am, did I see that correctly? Did you see the same thing? Like, do you feel like they're kind of going back to the humming and hawing of like, well, Kaprizov's here. It's fine. Yes. And we talked about this on Friday at our live show. Shout out Harbor Bar Stillwater for having us and shout out Grain Belt. Love working with you guys. Um, no, because I said it out loud and people were looking at me and they're like, wow, like, did she just say that? And then you were like, I tweeted that. And I was like, I didn't see your tweet. Like, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, like we had talked about it. I think we're on the same page as far as that. And I think I kind of even maybe alluded to it a week or two in a previous episode back. But he came back into the lineup and we saw, I was shocked at how well the wild were doing without Kirill. Mm -hmm. Everyone, everyone rose up and took their game, their personal game, their team game to a new level. We saw people scoring who typically hadn't stepped up when Kirill was in the lineup because they had to. Yeah. And now that Kirill's back, I've been less than impressed by the action from our offense. I think I think they are just looking for Kirill and they're leaning into him and then they're not even trusting like their own capabilities. So maybe not shooting the puck when they should be because they're like, oh, like maybe let's just pass it over instead. So mm -hmm. I've been really disappointed and I'm going to say it again on record. I think the wild play better when Kirill is not in the lineup and that has nothing to do with Kirill because Kirill is the superstar. He's everything. But the team as a whole, they just lean on him and everyone else kind of backs off and doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what that is and I don't know how you fix it. Yeah. It's not I, Kirill's problem. It's everyone no. else's problem. No, it's definitely not. And hopefully that changes, right? Maybe there's a switch that goes off. Like it's playoff mode every, and that should happen. Every player's mentality just gets a little bit grittier. If you will, using that grit first slogan there. How about that? Um, yeah. I mean, I think, because you can't, you all have to be pulling the rope in the same direction. You all have to be pulling it together. There's no way you get through the playoffs without that. Now, Bill Guerin said something interesting to Michael Russo at the athletic um, that he feels this team this year could be 
the team last year. Now, last year, everybody was very high on, right? Because there was so much scoring. Everybody was doing everything. And I think I understand where he's coming from because, again, it goes to that grit first mentality is like it is a grittier team. They shouldn't be doing as well as they have. And I look back at 20 years ago, that 2003 team, your conference final team. That team wasn't exactly plump full of superstars. You know what I mean? So you would imagine that everything should be in place for Minnesota to make a bigger run. Kirill Kaprizov included with everybody stepping in to help him. You know, like I think you do have some of these right pieces there. I just, I don't, I don't know. I don't don't know know either. I don't know. That's the name of the episode. I don't know. There's a lot of question (laughs) marks. There's a lot we don't know. And we're going to find out soon. Gonna find I mean, out. but we know most. We're experts in the field, so please always <laughs> continue to follow the Word on Beauties for all your hockey talk. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to guess. We're going to keep the I don't knows going and let you know how we think this series against Dallas is going to go. We will publicly state it, how the wins, losses are going to roll out, and if Minnesota advances. So stay tuned to find out what we think. Bye. back it was a quick break quick break we're going i gotta get to the rink um so kirsten we got it playoffs round one minnesota has not advanced past round one since 2015 not great not great i actually had a friend shout out to mark basara who tweeted me this morning he's like hey at least we've made the playoffs and i'm like how minnesotan are we that we're like you know what at least we did it again like that is the most minnesotan thing to say like no it's not good enough let's go let's get past this first round Kirsten I'll let you start how do you think Minnesota is going to do in the first round what do you think how many games is going to take who advances to the second I think it's going to go to six games okay I think Dallas is going to advance to the second round maybe that's a lot of the pessimist in me speaking just from prior experience but I will say I think the wild are going to show up I think they're going to play a good game And they're going to put forth a much better effort than I think we saw last year in the first round. I think part of it was last year, this team and everyone was so confident that like, okay, yeah, like this is the year, like we had such a great regular season. We're going to do it. And then you get blown out by the blues, which Mm -hmm. shouldn't have happened. So I think also back to your point about how, when Russo was talking to Garen and Garen said this year's team could have beat last year's team. I fully agree with that. I think this team They have the opportunity to dive deep within themselves and pull something out and surprise everybody. But I still am kind of like, I think it's going to be Dallas on the other end, but I hope I'm wrong. Please do they take one. So are those two wins? Do you think they're the wins at home or do they take one on the road? I think they take arguably both on the road and then lose at home. Yeah. Mm rough that's a rough go I know I hope I'm wrong but I just okay I like it I think it's gonna go to seven games because I'm selfish and I want seven games I'll for the sake of being different I'll say Minnesota can take it in seven I think you I mean you obviously that requires you to win a road game which is hard to do although Minnesota had home ice advantage last year didn't make a goddamn difference right so I think they take it in Yeah, seven. We're going seven. It's going to be a series. It's going to be one that we love to see in Minnesota is going to go to the second round. I said it. They're going to go to the second round. Kevin Gorg is stuck on that star. Give you an earful. Oh, no. (laughs) Per my contract with Kevin Gorg, I'm supposed to pick the opposition to win in order for the wild to win. But nope, it's playoffs. It's a new year. It's a new season. Playoffs are the start of a new season. So this is a new Jesse. Game seven, it goes to Minnesota. They'll win that, obviously, on the road. Again, Minnesota starting their playoffs today, Monday, in Dallas, playing at 8.30 p.m. You knew we were going to get those late-night games, you guys. I'm sorry. It's the luck of the draw, but they play Wednesday at 8.30. Friday in St. Paul, going to be rocking. Kirsten and I will be there waving the flags. I actually won't. I can't do that. I'm not allowed to do that. I can. I'll wave two. One for me, one for you. That would be Unless perfect. I'm holding a puppy, then I'll put it on like a bandana. Oh, that I know. Awesome. What an idea. Uh, and then they are home again. 530 start on Sunday. I'm glad I looked that up because I had no idea. I was like, oh, shoot. All right. I'll plan for an early game, which I love. 
I love it. I'm happy Sunday you'll game. be in attendance now that you know the schedule, Jesse. I know, right? Sometimes I pay attention, sometimes I don't. I like to take my breaks when I can, you know? So we'll see. All right, guys, thank you for checking us out. As always, shout out to our newest sponsor, Livia. You guys made me see me drinking my little shake here. Um, it's It's been really fun. Obviously, go check them out. Let them know Bardown Beauties and Jesse sent you. If I can do it, you can do it. It's not even that hard to pass a pizza as as it was. A little bit harder to pass a beer sometimes, but it's fine. We're working through it. It's all good. Uh, Livia's been fantastic. Shout out to the Woodbury Center that's been housing me. Uh, Grain Belt, we, again, another great live show in Stillwater last Friday. Loved Harbor Bar. Loved the people that came out. So thank you for all to all of them. Shout out to Soda Stick, uh, SodaStick.com, Bar Down Beauties. We'll get you 15% off. I don't know why I said that. So funny, but it will. Bar Down Beauties, 15% off all your purchases. Uh, Real Credit Union, less fee, more free. And Jim Beam, you can cheers to them throughout the playoffs. The official whiskey sponsor of your Minnesota Wild. And uh, yeah, you guys rock. We'll be back next week. Might have a guest, might not. We'll, we'll see. We'll find out what happens. It's that time of year, guys. It's just that time of year. We're rolling with the punches. And uh, go wild. Have a good day. This podcast is made possible due to listeners like you. Thank you.